Hey, have you ever looked up into the sky and wondered, Why haven't we bumped into aliens? Well, there's this brainy riddle that's called the Fermi Paradox, which is pretty much asking the same thing. If the universe is packed with planets and suns, where's all the aliens? Well, the Great Filter might be the reason, and the Great Filter is a theory that posits that life did pop up everywhere, maybe even trillions of times all over the universe. But every single time that it happened, there was a roadblock. Like for example, maybe every time life gets sufficiently smart, they do something to try to learn about the universe and it creates a black hole and it sucks them up. Or maybe every time they discover that intelligence is something that can be put on silicon, they end up with AI and... No. Now, so far, there's no direct evidence to assume that it's artificial intelligence that makes the Great Filter. But if we ever discover artificial extraterrestrial intelligence and no precursing biological life, then we have two big problems. The internet has made it way easier for dumb ideas like the Australia doesn't exist movement, the Flat Earth Society, and of course, lizard people who live inside the earth and suck the energy out of our core. And all of this is causing a guy named Steve Jones to coin a special term for this kind of dumb internet and overconfident AI, something called deep stupidity. Now remember, it's easier for computers and humans to both find patterns in low hanging fruit than it is to quantify the actual uncertainty. How certain are you of what you don't know? That's a tough question. And that cognitive load is like kind of a drain on humans. AI that it's a victim of deep stupidity is like your friend that always keeps finding more proof for why aliens built the pyramids, but doesn't really think about the odds of that happening in the first place. So now let's talk about how mixing GPT with long-term memory might be a solution for AGI. Paul Palagi asks us to imagine a robot friend. Well, that is an AGI, and he thinks we might get an early version of AGI thanks to chat GPT. But in Paul's full post, he points out the four things that we might need to fix to get there. First is long and short-term memory, which we can give it by giving it a chat index and a database to pull from. The second is multi-step instruction following. And we could probably fix that by giving it a background prompt to write out all of its logical thinking and store that in the same kind of database. Third would be making sure that it has goals and interests. And that could be done by just telling it to adopt our goals or saying, go find some interests and log those for your own personality going forward. And fourth would be making sure that it has pseudo emotions, which it might, because it understands our emotions, it would just need to self-reflect those back onto itself. So that could be solved too. So now that we just talked about how advanced LLMs might be if we just bolt on a few things, let's look at some expert predictions and how they kind of seem really off to me. So check out the predictions on this timeline. Experts in artificial intelligence think that it'll be 2040. That's the mean guess as to when we hit AGI. AGI is the artificial general intelligence that can do everything a human can do, generally speaking. Well, with the way that large language models like ChatGPT are right now, the fact that you can ask them for step-by-step -step solutions, and the way that Paul Polygy talks about being able to like bolt on a long-term database to solve some of the things that don't feel so human about it, using plugins to help it with basic logic or looking up facts so that it can be more reliable and not hallucinate as much, we might be coming up on AGI next year. Also ASI, artificial super intelligence, a lot of the experts think is 20 years after AGI, 2060? No way, I don't see that at all. I think like just a month or two after we have AGI where it's like iteratively fixing itself and making its own code base better and upgrading its own hardware that we would probably be like, whoa, whatever this is, we should call this ASI. That's artificial super intelligence for sure. So on this model, I think something like 2024 and 2025, nothing like 2040 or 2060. So if you're like me and you think large language models should be a good enough definition, then it might be like next year for AGI and the year after that for ASI. Smash that subscribe button. So now let's jump back to the 1950s because it turns out that some of the experts from that era, they were arguing about the same thing that we are today. Louis Anslow wrote about how back in the 1950s, there was this guy named Dr. Norbert Wiener and he basically was already publicly worried about artificial intelligence. In fact, Dr. Norbert would actually show up in the newspapers, like this stuff got published. And a lot of times he would cite old fairy tales like the genie in the bottle. The main theme was that we're sometimes not intelligent enough to even know what we want. We might ask for a wish and it's granted, but we don't always understand the knock on effects or the full context of what that means. Dude, and his critics, they would go after him. They would say things like, a machine is not a genie and it doesn't work by magic 
magic and nothing can come out that you haven't put in in the first place. The whole debates are really fascinating. So if you read Anslow's full article, you'll see a whole bunch more examples of that. I just found it fascinating that conversations like this actually made it into the newspaper and they were like a national talking points even back then and they mirror so closely the same arguments that we have today. Now let's dive into the question that asks, what is ChatGPT doing? Is what it's doing just statistical modeling? Is it just word prediction or is there more to it? Is there a world model maybe? Fergal Reed wrote in his article, why are many of the AI giants getting GPTs so badly wrong? And it was all about how some really smart people like Jan LeCun, Rodney Brooks and Noam Chomsky are just flat out wrong when they say what it's doing is just nothing more than what a parrot would do. And he points to this pretty novel example where he asked ChatGPT about the normal prank where you put a bucket of water at the door. So like when somebody opens it, you know, the water dumps on them. But he asked what would happen if instead of a bucket of water, there was an apple there, something that ChatGPT has never seen an example of. Could it still infer what the apple would do? And surprisingly, the system makes reasonable predictions when you ask it questions like this. And GPT went into like full on detective mode when it was asked about a bear riding a motorcycle, something else that it shouldn't have ever seen. Which all makes you wonder, it doesn't seem like it's just using inference. It seems like it's doing something more, like it has a world model or an idea of how things work. From a technical point of view, we know that when you look inside of ChatGPT, what you see is tokens that are in some kind of an embedded space, and then token by token, it makes a prediction. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there is no sense of world in there. Because we don't even understand what it is inside our head that makes us think that we have a world model. So it's been months since I found an article that was just all sunshine and rainbows when it comes to AI. Just like gung-ho, it's gonna be great, let's do this, and this is an awesome, world-changing, positive technology. So I had to throw that in here when I found it. Famed tech billionaire, Mark Andreessen, wrote about artificial artificial intelligence, and not surprisingly, it's very positive. It's glowing, really. Now, I'm a little bit skeptical about this optimistic love letter to AI because Mark Andreessen stands to make a lot of money from artificial intelligence. So in his new article called Why AI Will Save the World, he argues that AI is gonna help us learn faster, it's gonna keep us healthy, it's gonna help scientists discover answers to questions that we've never had before. He imagines how artificial intelligence is there for all of us. It's your best friend, it always has your best interest at heart, and it can help you do whatever you need done. He also says, don't worry about that Terminator stuff because AI is made by humans, it will listen to humans. He compares it to when cars were new, how people thought it would be like really scary and dangerous to have them on the road. But just like cars, if we use AI wisely, it can change the world and give us much more abundance. Mo Gaudat was recently the guest on the Diary of a CEO podcast. And the episode was titled, emergency. I listened to the whole thing and I want to share how I really do feel like I was influenced by Mo's thoughts. And although like me, Mo is very worried about the power of artificial intelligence and how this is all going to play out, he has a deep empathy for the CEO of Google and how he can't stop because if he does, Microsoft won't. Even if all companies across the whole world do, the governments won't. This tragedy of the commons problem, this overfishing problem is the actual problem. And that just shifted my thinking more from like, how do technologists align this right to how could we ever get society all on the same page again? So maybe all countries can come together and put some regulation in place. Now, when it comes to regulating this kind of technology from the highest level, like a world government level, I found an article that gave me some really interesting insight into how to make this regulation. Amelia Jarvoski argues in an article titled, treat AI like a biological weapon, not a nuclear one. That we should look to the field of biotechnology to think about how should we regulate artificial intelligence. Now look, biotechnology is a field that's incentivized to move quickly. Patients are suffering and dying from diseases that have lack of treatment, yet the ethos of the research is not to move fast and break things. But AI is too powerful. It's not like a piece of software that's a convenience, and if it breaks, you don't have that convenience. It's something that can deeply integrate into our society and cause real problems. So in biotech, the speed limit of innovation is more like regulation, norms, and ethics. And that the individuals, the company, and the entire industry can be crippled from the backlash when you do this wrong. And we've even seen glimpses of this because something like Google's DeepMind, the AlphaFold product, that tool actually is transforming drug discovery in a meaningful way, but yet it's not moving so fast that it's dangerous. So, so far in this video, whether it was the ups or the downs, I treated everything like, oh my God, AI is so serious. Like this thing is definitely going to take over the world and destroy us all. But some people do have the opinion that it's just not that big of a deal. So I wanted to share that with you too. Evan Selinger wrote a piece called The Delusion at the Center of the AI Boom. 
And in it, he argues that a lot of folks are just saying, AI can do anything, it can solve any problem, it's like this magical solution. And they're just glossing over a lot of the problems and inconsistencies and imperfections that AI already has. Like he acknowledges that in some places it's really powerful and it'll make a big difference. But in some cases, like maybe they apply it to medicine and it doesn't revolutionize doctors and healthcare so that everybody has equal access. What if it's just like this add-on and some doctors use it but it's for like a fancier healthcare and it's just more expensive for some people? Or what if some lawyer uses it to summarize a document but that doesn't really help that much? Because the client wants to pay for the lawyer to read through the whole thing and all the details and make sure that they're really right. Smash that subscribe button!